Remember the time we visited a Disney theme park and got to ride Star Tours and see Captain EO and the People Mover went through a whole Tronscape? Boy, that was the best vacation ever. Remember when Star Wars was just three brilliant films and we stood in line for each one as they came out in anticipation with a bunch of other people waiting for it to hit the big screen? That was the greatest film trilogy ever, wasn't it? And can you recall the first time you sat down to play Dungeons and Dragons and how amazing the whole thing was with the fighting and rescuing and leveling up and facing down evil and being a hero? Definitely the best game we've ever played. And think about the house you grew up in with all its familiar rooms and pleasant scents and the memories you made there. Weren't things just, you know, better back then? Isn't that the way everything should be, just like it was back then? Not like it is now. Now is terrible. Then was good. Well, if that's the way you feel, and that's the sort of thing you think, congratulations. You're sick. You have a disease not only for which no medical cure has ever been found, but which can also be fatal. Not sure what we're talking about? Well, you only have to ask 17th century Dr. Johann Hofer and the Swiss Army of the time. See, the Swiss Army had a problem. There wasn't a lot to do at home. No one was particularly interested in fighting them any more than they absolutely had to. And as you might imagine, it's hard for an army to army if no one wants to fight. You just stand around sipping cocoa and losing your fighting trim. Plus, it is very expensive to keep you in cocoa. So what you tended to do as a member of the Swiss Army was to hire yourselves out to whomever would pay the price to have you come fight in their army instead. Now, no one is going to pay to have you fight for them if you aren't any good at fighting. And fortunately for the people doing the hiring, the Swiss were very good indeed. Which is one reason no one back home wanted to fight them. They were so good at it, in fact, that practically everyone wanted the Swiss fighting for them at one point or another. And with nothing particular going on at home in Switzerland, the Swiss tended to just keep going from one job to the next, making mercenary money as they went. But then, along about the middle 1600s, something strange started happening to members of the Swiss army fighting in France. They'd be more or less fine one day, and the next, they'd be depressed and start wasting away, eventually dying of this mysterious disease which no one could quite understand and which didn't seem to have any sort of clear cause. Until 1688, when Dr. Hofer wrote the definitive, and at the time only, paper on the disease after having made a careful study of those afflicted by it. One case study relates the tale of a young man from Bern, Switzerland, who had been studying abroad for some time. He was, by all accounts, a man of normally pleasant disposition, but had recently become rather melancholy. One day he awoke and complained of a burning fever, though no fever was evident. The fever seemed to persist on him for several days, growing gradually worse. So bad did things become that the family he was staying with took to saying daily public prayers for him because they feared that death was imminent. The man's attending physician, finding that symptoms were not alleviated by the application of several enemas, among other things, decided that he must, as soon as possible, be sent back home, there to die among his family. Well, remarkably, as soon as this plan was made known to the man, and the family he was staying with began actually preparing for the journey, he began feeling better. And as preparations carried on and the journey commenced, his condition and symptoms improved to such a degree that by the time his wagon pulled into Bern, he was pronounced completely cured and well. And this turned out to be the cure for virtually everyone suffering from this curious illness. Nothing medical, just a trip back home. And what was this disease that could only be cured by returning the victims to their homes, Swiss army included? Why, das Heimweh, or acute homesickness, of course. 
or as Dr. Johann Hofer named it when he wrote the first clinical description, nostalgia. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Can you have nostalgia for five minutes ago? We sure do. Our sentences were better than our ideas clearer. We had intention and purpose and our fingers flew across the keyboard. Not like the sort of script writing you get these days. The sentences are short, too direct, uninteresting. Keyboards light up too much and keys are too clacky. Page two just isn't like page one used to be. We wish we could go back to page one and just hang out there forever. Problem is, of course, that page one wasn't really like that. Page one was just as difficult and tricky to write then as page two is now. And this is the fundamental problem that those Swiss soldiers were facing all the way over in France. France wasn't anything like they remembered Switzerland being. Well, the Switzerland they thought they remembered at any rate. Basically, the Swiss were away from home and in pretty miserable condition since they were fighting other people's wars for them. And when you find yourself fighting and dying for a cause you aren't particularly invested in and see your comrades doing the same, all so you can make a little money and occupy your time, it tends to wear on your mind somewhat. You're not all that happy about the situation as it stands and you soon find yourself feeling a little melancholy and depressed. Now, the human mind likes to find reasons for the way it feels, whether those reasons make sense or not. And once the Swiss started feeling bad, they cast about trying to assign blame for their bad feelings. And what was all around them but the French countryside. Which, obviously, wasn't nearly as good as the Swiss countryside. Why, in the Swiss countryside, you had rolling hills backed up by the Swiss Alps and loads of scenic beauty that, as far as the Swiss were concerned, was the best you could ever ask for. This French stuff was a very poor second. And the cows were better, too. And remember the pretty little Swiss maid waiting for you back home? Not at all like these coarse French girls. And the lovely little Swiss farmhouses? And the taste of real Swiss cheese? And, well, you get the idea. Swiss things were just better things than the French things. Pretty much all of them. And so that must be the reason you, the Swiss soldier, were so depressed. This French stuff was terrible when compared to home. Now, for most people, the rest of the world wasn't really like that. Or if it was, they were much better at dealing with it. In fact, the older you are, and the more experience you have of different people and places, the less likely you are to have these feelings of everything from home is better than everything foreign the less likely you are to be homesick. The Swiss soldiers, though, especially those who really suffered from Dr. Hofer's nostalgia, had a few unique characteristics that meant they were more likely to contract nostalgia than others. Many of them had grown up in relative isolation. Being from remote areas was one cause, but so was the tendency for many of the Swiss to put their nose to the grindstone when it came to education. So much so that they would hole up on their own and do nothing but study for days or weeks on end without seeing anyone beyond their immediate family or going anywhere beyond the confines of either their house or the land it was on. They just didn't have the skills to deal with new people in new places because they hadn't really had to up to the point where they were conscripted into the army. And without the proper skills in place, anywhere foreign was indeed terrible. For one thing, all the people spoke a different language. And not just the foreign people whose fighting you were doing, but also your own comrades coming as they did, not only from those same foreign lands as part of the army you were working for, but also from different parts of Switzerland where dialects were different. And the customs were strange as well, as was the manner of dress and the design of the buildings and the way the roads were laid out and the kinds of animals and plants and trees you saw and everything you experienced one way or another, just served to point out how out of place you were and how alien everything was to your experience. So no wonder you felt isolated, alone, and sad. It was completely understandable because you just didn't have enough experience of other people and places 
to know how to handle it. There was no telling what would trigger the onset of nostalgia either. It could be almost anything. Anything that led to the stray thought that home was better than away. However, Hofer was able to identify a few specific triggers in his paper, one of which was music. Not just any music, though. No, sir or madam. It was the music of cows that specifically set some of them off. See, across Switzerland, as indeed it is across many countries, were a bunch of farms. And farms, by their very nature, tend not to be located where lots of people are gathered and interacting, like cities. So a farm full of cows starts off naturally isolated from lots of people to interact with in order to have enough room for all the cows people needed to interact with. But the Swiss had a particular fondness for keeping track of their cows by sound, which necessitated almost every Swiss cow being equipped with a very nice Swiss bell. The movement of the cows across the Swiss landscape was accompanied by the clangs and clongs of the bells creating a sort of naturally occurring music that permeated much of the Swiss countryside. The people of Switzerland enjoyed it, and it was strongly associated with memories of home. And, as we're sure anyone who has listened to this podcast for more than five minutes knows, music can trigger very strong emotional responses for a variety of reasons. What the cows thought of it, though, was anyone's guess. Well, in France, the bells were few and far between, and they certainly didn't sound like the lovely tuned Swiss bells when they were heard. So it wasn't very long before one Swiss soldier was turning to another Swiss soldier and saying something along the lines of, Oh, Dieter, this is nothing like the bells we have back home, is it? And then waking up the next morning with imaginary debilitating fevers and depression. Johann Hofer reckoned that what was going on was this. In noticing how different things were, and lacking any skills to deal with these differences appropriately, the mind of the Swiss soldier was casting about for reasons to explain their sudden sadness. Having latched onto one possible explanation, things back home were better, the brain would then focus on that idea exclusively as the cause of the depression. The trouble with that was the soldier could do very little with that supposed information when it came to trying to fix the perceived problem. He couldn't bring home here to France, and being that he was conscripted into the army, he couldn't just up and go home either. He was, in a very real sense, stuck in the middle of the thing that was causing his condition. There was no way out. Because of that, his melancholy turned to depression, which simply deepened and deepened the more he thought about how much better everything was back home. And because the mind runs the body, it wasn't long before the external state began to match the internal state, and soldiers began to sicken and, in some cases, die. Their depression translated into a lack of care and concern for themselves, and from there, it was all downhill. The word nostalgia itself, as coined by Dr. Hofer, was constructed from two Greek words. Nosos, which means return to the native land, and algos, which meant suffering or grief. So nostalgia very literally meant the sad mood originating from the desire to return to one's native land. And the condition all comes down to the imagination. The soldiers imagined that things were better back home. Not because they really were better back home, but because they had no experience of anywhere else to compare it to. The French had many fine things, croissants, for example, but in the formerly secluded soldier's mind, thanks to its ability to not only take familiar things and remember them more strongly, but also its ability to smooth over the unpleasant or bad parts of a memory in favor of the good parts, none of the good things of France were imagined to measure up. Everything was terrible, and they just wanted to go home. Just like that other classic group of nostalgia sufferers, kids away at summer camp for the first time. However, there are two key differences between the kid at camp and the Swiss soldier. First, the kid at camp knows they're just there for a short time, no matter how traumatic the situation might seem. But the soldier, as we mentioned, had no idea when or even if he could get back home. He might die right there and never see the fatherland again. Which was the second major difference between kids and soldiers. The Swiss 
really did love their homeland quite a bit. A camp kid likes home and their parents and all that stuff, and it does make a rough start to camp week until they get used to the idea of being away. But they can learn to enjoy themselves and have a good time without feeling like home was going to fall apart without them. However, this is nothing compared to the Swiss love of Switzerland and all it had to offer. It was a part of the Swiss national character to be deeply and strongly devoted to home. So much so that the typical Swiss soldier of the day would put aside their own needs and wants and desires in service to their devotion to their country. If you were Swiss, Switzerland came first, and your personal needs were a distant third at best. Therefore, in the Swiss mind, it was only right and proper to be fixated on the fatherland in the first place. The more thought and effort you put into loving, supporting, and encouraging Swissness, the more demonstrably devoted to Switzerland you were, and the more you were encouraged to be so. So in the onset of nostalgia, when your thoughts were turning to home and how awesome it was, there was very little internal incentive to stop thinking this way and snap out of it. And you certainly weren't likely to be encouraged to do so by your Swiss comrades either. That would be tantamount to disloyalty, perhaps even blasphemy. Fortunately, once Hofer laid out the description and symptoms of this disease of nostalgia, it was easy to spot someone likely to suffer from it, symptoms which may still hold true today. If someone frequently wanders about in a sad mood, they might be suffering from it, especially if they scorn foreign manners or are seized by a distaste of strange conversations. If a person is naturally given to melancholy, or they take jokes or slight injury or other petty inconveniences too harshly, they might be particularly predisposed to the disease. If they frequently make a great show of the delights of their homeland, and go about declaring them far superior to all foreign things, if they gather together with others like them to air their grievances and appear to live and breathe only things of the fatherland, well, for them, it may already be too late. And so, as you have heard, too much nostalgia is a bad thing. Although it has to be said, the proposed treatments at the time were little better. Remember that primarily, nostalgia starts as something else, feeling a bit bad, or maybe even a genuine unrelated illness, which the mind eventually decides is due to being away from home. As such, treating nostalgia echoes treatments for other diseases. The early stages of nostalgia, if no other illness presents themselves, should, of course, be treated by purging, to remove from the stomach an overload of foreign residues. If you were in doubt what to use to achieve this purging, Dr. Hofer quite reasonably suggests the application of cephalicum, which, as near as we can find out, appears to be sulfuric acid, usually applied to the head so as to raise blisters and thereby improve the disposition of mental patients. If that isn't handy, then by all means feed them mercury, which you can mix with a little wine if you happen to have any, though it scarcely matters. If for some reason the patient is nauseous, then by all means administer other emetics to help them purge, and if that fails, well, time to bleed them. Mind you, this is all for someone you only suspect is becoming nostalgic. For someone who actually is, the treatments only get worse and less effective. The doctor's final word is that above all else, to save the life and health of the patient, they must be taken back to the fatherland as soon as is possible. If this cannot be done, all that is left to do is watch the patient sicken, slip into delirium and mania, and then finally die. And so, we see that nostalgia was a serious medical condition, a particular affliction of those who led isolated lives suddenly being exposed to new places, peoples, ideas, and things. Thank goodness that couldn't possibly happen anymore. Why, surely everyone gets out and around and mingles with other people on a regular basis. They definitely go out and experience new places and do new things, don't they? Why, you'd practically have to confine someone to their own homes by government order to even risk being afflicted by nostalgia, wouldn't you? And that's not likely to happen, is it? Is it? 
Remember when we used to go out of doors and into the fresh air and hang out with our friends and do fun things? Remember? Things really were better then, weren't they? But we're not done with nostalgia yet. Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. And yes, we've got a little nostalgia series planned. Won't that be fun? If you'd like to help support the show and keep us on our toes, head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com and check out the support page by clicking the yellow banner at the top. Every contribution, no matter the form, is greatly appreciated and means we can do things that improve the show like hitting up a paid archive for the translation of Dr. Johann Hofer's original paper describing the disease, which we did for this episode. And if you already support us, Thank you so much for making that sort of thing possible. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, based on an idea from Scott Rem. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Nostalgia is a file that removes the rough edges from the good old days.